your sense of community when you're free rolling through the mountains rolling through the valley rolling through paradise with me hello everyone welcome to the show well, today's guest, I, I was reading her profile on Facebook, and it says, uh, First Nations in Alberta Film, bringing you all the magic in Alberta films. From Alberta, Mary Graham. Welcome to the show, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, by the way, for, for agreeing to be here. I really do appreciate it. So tell me about uh, Alberta Films and what it is you, what you do. What I do is I um, I wrote a book on the history of filmmaking um, that uh, when I started it, it was I started with the modern films because there's so many important films that were made in Alberta, um, but I didn't see a connecting thread through them. And as I got researching, I started getting little glimmers of the very early film industry. For, for example, I'd Google Morley, which is the Nakota Reserve, and up came a little two-line sentence from the LA Times in 2017, or 19, 1917, that uh, Frank Berzaghi had just gotten back from the Morley Reserve to film Until They Get Me. And um, I went for about two years. Uh, Frank Berzaghi is a very, won the first Academy Award. He's a very important filmmaker. Um, I went for about two years and then I just realized that there was so much history and there were so many, I it just kept growing on me and, and the people became more and more important and it wasn't really cataloged anywhere. So I split the book into two parts. So for me with film history right now, I've just finished the first book to 1960, from 1917 to 1960. And now I'm working on the second book, which is, which I now have a foundation to understand the modern times. Okay. So what's the name of your book, by the way? Oh, it's the stunning, uh, uh, it, we, we had a lot of ah, the, no, ah, a, a stunning backdrop, Alberta in the movies, 1917 to 1960. Okay, so what made you want to uh, study film and the history of film? Um, I think, you know, I really hated Alberta when I moved here, but my, my daughters were born here and I knew I had to to learn to love it. And the way I did that was to really soak in the landscapes and, you know, Cal so I live in Calgary and you can go five minutes from the city and you can just be in these incredible landscapes that open your mind and, and they're beautiful and they're freeing. And, you know, you you can go, do I want to go to the Badlands today? Do I want to go to the mountains? They're all within an hour or two's drive. So I really, really grew to love the landscapes and, and they really inspired me. And um, my husband is half Hawaiian and he was very ill. And we took him home to, he's he's from a, a little tiny town at the end of the road in Kauai, but we, we took him home to, uh, to heal. And... Um, the only thing we could do, Kauai has a very famous movie book, and the only thing we really could do with with you know a, a, an eight year old and a, a teenager was um, drive around and look at the landscapes in this book, and it was absolutely fascinating. And when I we got back, I assumed there'd be something for Alberta because, I mean, it, it just there's there's more more movies filmed here, or or more yeah, um, it just it anyway the. Kauai has a very interesting film history, but it's not as 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 big as Alberta's. So, um, but there was nothing, and um, I um, I started researching it and started seeing things that were really really intriguing about the people that came here. I mean, in the 1920s, um, just a fascinating period, um, and uh, so I approached some people in the industry, and and um, they thought it was a good idea, and then. I just uh, kept going. So, okay. <laughs> no, I imagine uh, in, in doing that, you've made a lot of connections with the people, with the uh, um, original people, uh, First Nations or others like settlers that came early on. One of the things that really changed this book, it was it was to be a book of landscapes because there's so many beautiful, beautiful um, film shot in Alberta that use the power of the landscapes by many prominent directors. And, and, but 
the, you can't really do a film history until you see all the films. And I, I was gathering all the films and the Nakoda were in a lot of them. And I, and I think I'm allowed to say this now, it's been a long time coming, but um, there were scenes in four or five of the movies that just did not make sense um, that the directors had put in. And, and we're talking really, really big directors, important directors. And I always found the more, the, the more, the better the director, the the more empathy, the more artistic he is, and the more, you know, they were. So anyway, the one of these scenes was a 1937 Moody movie, and um, it was actually the one of the top five Westerns of the 1930s and the top eight Western. And the Nakoda are in the movie and they, it's about Hells Bells Rogers finding the Canadian pass and he's assembling a team to, to take him up into the mountains and over the rivers. And he's interviewing some Nakoda and um, they, their names are, are a combination of their characteristics and nature. So one of I think it's Enos Hunter, the elders identified. One of one of the the Nakoda in the film said his uh, Nakoda name, and they were like, "Oh, oh, speak English." So he he brought out the full interpretation of the name, which is, I think, um, I mean, we had a long talk in this. I worked with the elders a long talk about this, but I think he said John Snow drifting in the rain, and um, it just was not necessary to the film. It shouldn't have been there. It, it didn't, you know, it was strange. And, and what, so I worked with uh, 12 to 15 elders for about two years. We're, we're still in contact. We, we still have more work to do. We know that. Um, and um, what we were finding, they would watch the movies and they would identify, and we're talking a hundred years of movies, they would they would identify their ancestors, they would identify the filming locations, mm -hmm. uh, their language, their uh, teepees were white, they weren't, you know, gussied up for spectacle. Mm -hmm. um, what we were finding in those films was that they were leaving messages to the future, to their people, and it's just absolutely magical. Um, you know, they were never credited. A lot of their work in films was never acknowledged. And um, what we did was recapture their importance to the film industry. And um, I guess we started seeing those those magical messages a number, well, probably three or four years ago. And everybody was, nobody really liked that. They told me what they were, but we really didn't know if we should talk about it, but it, you know, it's a sign of, it's very strategic. It's a sign of power. It's a sign of agency. They knew what they were doing and they're leaving very, very powerful messages. And it's, it's absolutely amazing. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. But... No, this is great. No, no, this is great. It, it just sort of, um, you know, you, you when you speak about films, I read a book, I can't remember his first name, it's, his last name is King. And I think it's called the, An Inconvenient Indian. And, and it talks about how, we learned about Indians through uh, a film, um, which is not, you know, like the like the the westerns was always the good guys were always the white people and you know as things like that. So uh, I like I really appreciate what you're talking about and what you're doing. I think it's very important. It's more now more so than ever. You know, um, the very early directors probably like there was a time in the late. 19 you know between 1913 and 1920 when black filmmakers indigenous filmmakers and female filmmakers were were, be, were very creative and very powerful and certain people didn't like that and it got stopped when when the studios got monetized but um when they came you know some of the biggest directors of all time came to alberta in the 1920s and when they originally came to film they were looking for realism they weren't mm -hmm. Canada has a different history of settlement. It was just as violent and just as suppressive and just as odious and, and many other things, but um, they didn't have the violent history. And what the elders told me is they were very strategically not, deliberately did that not to put their people through that. They were actually warned by Sitting Bull. He came up and warned them, be careful. And um, But they photographed a lot of 
the Nakoda are in the most films in the last century. Certainly the Samson Cree, you know, I haven't even touched that history, but they were in a lot of the early films too. They have a really cool archives on the reserve. Um, but um, they, were, they weren't here to film them as movie Indians. They were here to film them as they were in the wilderness. And what's that? I, nice, I like that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you would see their teepees in the wilderness and, and you know, Frank Barzaghi, who came here, came three times to work with the Nakoda and he was absolutely enchanted with one of the chief's sons, Frank Powderface. And Frank's grandson, they always correct me, was in the Stony Film Project. Um, we didn't know who Frank was for a number of years. We kept seeing him in pictures, but um, I did a deep dive and he actually, there's a picture in the book and, and in many of the archives, we found picture, I found pictures of uh, Frank Rosagi sitting in a teepee circle with many Nakoda laughing and talking and Frank Powder faces in front of them. And the teepees are white, there's no decoration. They're in, the, they're in a wilderness setting. And what he did with Frank, and there's pictures of him with Frank on his shoulders. And um, he taught him to go like this and go hi mucky muck every time he saw a white person. <laughs> and he actually cred credited Frank, Frank in the film. but. When he filmed him, uh, when he the scene that that Frank and his family did was a teepee in the wilderness. Um, his mom was tanning hides. His father came out of the teepee, and Frank was running around, um, not calling people "hi, mucky muck," but you know. Um, so, you know, um, I guess as the century progressed. And it was it was really difficult work. It was hard for me. It was it was hard for the elders. It was it was, uh, um, you know, uh, you started seeing the their roles change and the racism come into it and the expectations put on them and um, the sexualization of their women, the objectification of their women because indigenous women were taboo in those days. So they had, the filmmaker solution was Métis women who were from the wilds, but educated in Montreal. Um, and, you know, watching the changes to their culture over a century were just devastating. We, it was, it was heart wrenching. Um, as we got into the more recent films, we, a lot of the times, because a lot of the elders in the room were in the films and a lot of the times we would just play their scenes and laugh you know <laughs> but we had uh we were always joined by the iatsi the film union and there were a lot of really good discussions and and it, as we we went for about a year and a half um kind of got curtailed by the opioid crisis and, and, and the horrible things going on but for it, um within their communities and um but um we do have more work to do and I think we'll probably hopefully continue it but yeah they're very proud of it I can say that I was very concerned when I wrote the book yeah. I wrote it for them mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure that um we I fought so hard to keep that thing pure there were so many agendas coming in and people you know people would come in or correct them or talk talk over or pretend that they knew more yeah. And I got into so many battles and, and took a few scars along the way, but we fought, really fought to keep it pure. And they're so proud of it. They threw a party for me and, it, you know, boy, did they party? <laughs> boy, did they represent. So. Wow. So, so, yeah. That is so fascinating. Now, now in your book, um, do you name the films so that if, and if people want to look them up, could they, are they able to find them? I name all the films. There's a list at the back and, um, Basically, what I did was sort of give a record of, I think, were, you know, of, of the, the making of each film from an Indigenous perspective, uh, from an Alberta's perspective, from filmmaker's perspective. Um, and I also traced the history of um, the Nakoda, which is representative of, of the history of you know, Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, it was a huge project and I, I, I'm going to tackle other bands for the next book, but it was it was, it was was very big. Um, but I traced a century of, you know, what had been done to them, the brutalization, the changes to their culture and, and um, alongside the filmmaking. So you can see that too and, and see why they, um, you know, they, one of the, Big things we had. A, we had a couple projects with, with some young people from the reserve, and 
their reserves, there's, there's three reserves. Um, and one of the big problems we had was explaining um, why their ancestors and their elders and their great, great chiefs were in these racist movies, particularly in the 50s. And this was before the, the uh, um, you know, everybody got very, uh, everybody became aware of the, the unmarked graves and the residential schools. It certainly was, was um, you know, they were certainly aware of it. It wasn't new to them, but it was before there was sort of attention. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they, They when we when we when we screened some of the more racist scenes, I was terrified. I I would I had to go into myself and look at everything that made me racist. And I understand that I you know I am, and I had to really, um, you know, get around that yeah. to to be able to work. And and they would there were scenes I was terrified to screen for them and they would just burst out laughing because they were so ludicrous and 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 um there were things about their culture particularly in the 50s that were very offensive isn't even the right word very very upsetting to them um in one movie uh they do a they, they call themselves the bikini bad boys they do a dance in in <laughs> in suede loincloths a lot of sometimes they wore their own clothes sometimes depending on the director uh sometimes they were given outfits and there's a, a quote-unquote indian princess which um i i seriously thought it was one of the first examples but i did find a 1926 movie with an indian princess on broadway so it's been going on a long time you know the sexualization and the whole princess thing but um she was obsessed with the Métis trapper and her father, the chief, was very opposed and she murders him. And they were very upset by that because it was it was so against everything in their culture. Um, so it was we it was a lot of learning, mostly me, but there was a lot of learning. So. <laughs> I'm learning a lot about First Nations people, too, and it's it's such a wonderful experience. It really is. Um, so I'm always happy to talk to anybody who's involved, whether they're First Nations or not, you know. It's the most beautiful and the most challenging thing you'll ever do. I I get overwhelmed by the, the, the magnitude of the oppression and the brutality and the cruelty and, and the, the fact that it's been allowed to fester for so long um, and, the, and the myths and the stereotypes. Yes, yes, for sure. You know, it's kind of interesting because uh, with talking with my brothers and sisters, we always knew about some of the the injustice that was done. We just didn't know the mag. I don't know how we knew, uh, but we had no idea of the magnitude. You know, I I think um, you know, I I think that, I mean, I I have been with with young people and driving them out to a film screening in, you know, the, the government let us use a, 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 an auditorium in the mountains and people will chase my car and, and, and yell and swear at me. Or I, I have seen things with the elders um, in the midst of our film screenings, we've had to stop for hor horrible, horrible things being done to them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I don't understand it. But why we feel that they are less than and not human and and that we, I don't understand it. I, I will never understand it. But it's this, this, I think this disregard or it's not important because they don't matter. So that's probably why we haven't heard about the magnitude of it. And they're, what they've said to me is, you know, basically... They they were very strategic making those movies. They were very they were highly highly intelligent. I think they were actually afraid of them, and it, when they were signing the treaties, they were smarter than us. But um, it was just a matter of don't say anything, don't speak up, don't make them mad because it'll be worse. Right. So just keep you know, don't talk back to anything. Let them say whatever they're going to say <laughs> or do. Well, it, unfortunately, yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I'm like you. I, I will never understand it. Uh, um, now, before you moved to Alberta and before you got involved with the the, the refilming, uh, research filming, um, 
Did you know much or were you in much contact with First Nations people prior to? Um, it, not really. I, um, I lived in Halifax for a time when I went to school and one of my roommates, um, I had a, a three or four roommates who were from Cape Breton and one, one of them um, was married to a Mi'kmaq uh, lawyer who was actually going to law school in Saskatchewan. Uh, but she was she was white. Um, we we definitely piled around. But when he went to Saskatchewan, he asked me to take care of her. So and then when I was in journalism school, he did um, you know he did appear on the, the student TV with me for interviews and stuff. Uh, and I, I learned a little bit, but not just the tip of the iceberg. So yeah, right. Yeah, I'm always so fascinated. And I and I'm what I tell people, uh, uh, non-indigenous people, is just listen. Yeah, hear them and listen, right? They, it's all in us. It's in our attitudes. It's in our views. We've been, I don't know if, you know, programmed is the appropriate word, but. Oh, it's a good word. <laughs> we have been programmed to be racist. We yes. have been, and we have accepted the brutality. I mean, I just watched Thunder Bay, that four-part documentary on what's going on in Thunder Bay and just the brutality and, and the, the concealing it and protecting it it's yeah. it's mind-boggling um and and they didn't do that they had nothing to do with that they they were in no way responsible for that that is all from us and our culture and we have to look at ourselves and say what have you know absolutely and it's really difficult i don't know if you find that when i'm talking to even with some of my family members like they want to deflect all the time you know um well, you know, the chiefs lived in big houses while the rest of them don't, you know, <laughs> you know? it's the black thing. That's what that, that is, in my opinion, you know, they don't want to hear or talk about the real issues, right? Well, they did, you know, the, the one thing I learned with the elders, they didn't have a monetary culture. They didn't have property ownership. Um, their women were the negotiators and they should have negotiated the treaties. Right. But they do deflect all the time. And there, there's these myths that somehow... You know, I, I think at this point, and I don't I don't want to speak for them, but I think they just want to be treated like human beings and participate and live good lives. So if people are living in big houses, I mean, that's our interpretation. When I, <laughs> when I started um, working, doing the film project specifically, I was going around telling everybody how racist they were, and that didn't go over too well. So <laughs> it's, it's the same. So, I mean... You know, um, it's 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 not on it's 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 on you to really look at. I think the residential schools really, when that broke open a couple of years ago, that really shook people up. The level of violence, the brutality to those babies, those innocent babies who did nothing, right. their families did nothing, and it was simply, you know, it was they wanted to eradicate them. It's plain yeah. and simple. They they starved them. I mean. In my book, I talk about that, you know, anytime they wanted something from them, when they wanted them to move for railway tracks, they starved them, um, because as they took away their, their lifestyle and their culture, and, um, you know, they left them with no means to support themselves, although they always and they would not want me to use the word starve, they, they, they we had a long session about that, but, mm -hmm. um, they always took care of their people and that was very, very important. And they work as a community. They don't have people who live in big houses. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, there's a show, uh, um, uh, Living Life Below Zero or something like that. And it's mostly in the Yukon and areas of that. And it talks about how, uh, whether it's a male or a female person go out and they'll hunt and that maybe if they get a, 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 a moose or something, then they share it. They don't just keep it for themselves, right? They oh. share with the village, especially the elders. Absolutely. And it was, you know, that's, that, that is, you know, uh, um, I, 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 yeah, uh, that is, that is what their culture was. And it's, it's, we are so completely alien to them. I mean, when you really look at us, uh, who invented pornography? I mean, I, yeah. you know, I, I've lost my religion over this. I can't, I can't even listen to churches whine and not take responsibility for what they've done and their part in it um you know uh this is i mean the elders and i were talking once about royalty and how 
people in their their communities um, became leaders, and I'm, I'm not sure if they really like the term great chiefs, but it, it, we uh, we do use it. Great chiefs, based on who they were and and how they behaved, not on property ownership or um, what they could provide for the so-called king. It was it was all monetary based. There was nothing about it. So they, you know, why there's nothing to respect in those people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, we're going to run out of time, so I'm going to have. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, please, no, no. I'm going to have you back on. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Definitely. But just down camera, I just want to remind everybody that you've been listening to Mary Graham uh, from Alberta. And um, like her, you know, I'm just I find it incredulous that we have so much uh, prejudice against people by their the color of their skin or like I ne I will never, ever understand that. Um, find it, find a First Nation person and sit down and talk to them and just listen to them. And maybe you'll change your mind a little bit. You know, don't believe everything you read or told by the government, sorry, but that's the way I feel. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for watching the show. I hope you continue to do so. Take care and peace out, everyone. A sense of community, till the wax a place to be. A sense of community, we are free. Rolling through the mountains, rolling through the valley. Rolling through paradise with me It's multicultural You're sure to see it all Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see Come party in the park Go dancing after dark Chilliwack's the place to be, you'll see